As an invested partner to the swine industry and the people behind it, Merck Animal Health is dedicated to supporting you and the well-being of your operation now and in the future, working right alongside you to help address your challenges. Our prevention-centric focus provides greater possibilities for profitability through healthier pigs, improved animal welfare, and unrivaled support in a quickly evolving marketplace. Merck Animal Health, driven by prevention. All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started with this afternoon's uh, talks. Uh, so hopefully everybody enjoyed a uh, really good lunch here, and, and uh, maybe here at break time we can get some more coffee so we can keep a, keep a tent. But I think we've got some good speakers here uh, through this session. Um, I think we'll really provide some good insight here, uh, really sort of centered around foreign animal disease and African swine fever. So to start us off here this afternoon uh, is Dr. Scott D. Uh, Dr. D earned his DVM, Master's, and PhD from the University of Minnesota, is a board-certified veterinary microbiologist and a past president of the American Association of Swine Veterinarians. After working in swine practice for 12 years, Scott was a professor at the University of Minnesota College of Veterinary Medicine, where he studied the transmission and biosecurity of PERS, and chaired the Admissions and Scholastic Standing Committee for a 12-year period. In 2011, Scott joined Pipestone Veterinary Services, where he currently serves as Director of Pipestone Applied Research, PAR, a business unit that conducts collaborative research efforts with production companies across North America and Asia, com <coughs> comprising approximately 2 million sows. Scott's been awarded over $11.8 million in research funds, has published 162 papers in peer-reviewed journals, including the initial publications providing proof of concept of PED transmission in feed and the transboundary survival of African swine fever virus in feed. 202 scientific abstracts, 31 textbook chapters, and 449 preceding papers. He has received the AASV Practitioner of the Year Award and the Howard Dunn Memorial Awards, the Layman Science and Practice Award, and a warrior chip from the FBI Weapons of Mass, Destruc Weapons of Mass Destruction Directorate. And in 2019, was named a master of the U.S. pork industry. Scott and his wife, Lisa, and their two children, Nicholas and Ellen, live in Alexandria, Minnesota, with their Scottish Terrier, Matilda. So I think uh, really, uh, certainly a notable resource in the industry to come speak with us uh, this afternoon and look forward uh, to what you have to say. Dr. D, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's great to be back in Sheeman. It's been a long time since I've seen a lot of you folks in person. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, I've done three live talks now in the last three weeks. Since then, 2020, February was the last one. So it's great to be in front of a live crowd again. I'm really excited to be here at uh, this great conference. What a wonderful program. You gave me a lot of nice accolades. Perhaps the thing I'm most famous for, I went to vet school with Mark Fitzsimmons. So there we go. <laughs> to me, I think that's big time. You know, the FBI is no big deal, but going to school with Fitz, that's an, ad that's an adventure, that's an adventure. Okay, so you heard I would, I'm working on uh, the feed risk. That's what I'm talking to you about today. Uh, it really began in 2014, January, when we found live PED virus in feed bins that were feeding index cases of the disease on farms. We took the scrapings from those bins, we fed them to pigs under experimental conditions and showed transmission. It was the first published or the first uh, attempt to do that. And so ever since that time, I've been really interested in this topic. And you can see the, the, a lot of the uh, logos on the screen. We've really built a nice team to help me with this, and it's been a wonderful collaboration. Uh, SAM Nutrition, you'll hear about them. They're our responsible imports partner. Uh, South Dakota State University, that's Dr. Eric Nelson. The SHIC, Swine Health Information Center, provided most of the funding for this. Also, the Minnesota Board of Animal Health. Kansas State, I have two great collaborators there, Dr. Cassandra Jones and Dr. Megan Niederwerder. You'll hear both of their names talked about a lot today, and then our team at Pipestone. So my topics for you today are, let's have a quick review of foreign animal diseases. We've got Dr. Erlinson talking with much more experience than I, so I'm gonna quickly go through that and let him take it over from there in regards to ASF. We'll go over the science of virus survival in feed. What do we know from the laboratory and the demonstration project level? We'll talk about what's the industry done? What's going on in the industry? What are people doing to reduce this risk? And then have we made a difference? Has all this effort for the last seven years actually done any good? That's the most important thing. You can publish all these papers, but if they don't help people, they're just dusty old things on a library shelf, and we don't wanna do that. So foreign animal diseases, a quick review. 
Upper left-hand corner, that's foot and mouth disease. Right below that is pseudorabies virus. The red uh, shapes you see there, that's classical swine fever. And then there's African swine fever right below that. These are four viruses we don't have in North America and four viruses we definitely don't want in North America. We know why these diseases are important. I'm preaching to the choir. You all know what would happen if these diseases got into our country. We all know how much they will cost. These are the estimated costs in the first year of FMD, 12.9 billion. Classical swine fever, about 9.6 billion. And African swine fever, about 16.5 billion. Not only shutting down our exports, depressing prices of poultry and beef at the same time, really reducing our grain exports, and actually tourism even goes down during a foreign animal disease breaks because nobody wants to come here. They think they're gonna break, bring something back. The only thing that goes up during these episodes of uh, tragedy is the human suicide rate. There's a good publications that show, you know, like in England, when FMD got into England or into Holland, uh, the suicide rate actually goes up. That's the only thing I've found that actually increases during these terrible episodes. That's very sad. ASF, Dr. Erlinson will handle it, but we know it's a double-stranded DNA virus in the family Asfaviridae. I think it's the world's worst pig virus. It kills almost 100% of the pigs it infects. We've seen it in our China operations as well at Pipestone. Good thing it doesn't infect people. It infects only pigs. We can eat pork from ASF positive pigs. It's not in North America, and there's no effective vaccine yet. I know there's a lot of work being done. We really hope that works out. Okay, it's moving around. It's a disease of three continents now, Africa, Asia, and Europe. It's moving from Eastern Europe, as you know, to Western Europe through wild boar migration. The wild boar is the primary way that the virus is moving in Europe. However, the European Food Safety Authority just announced the scientific opinion that feed is a low risk but cannot be ignored. We'll talk more about that. In China and Asia, you see the spread of the virus. First reported in uh, Xinjiang, uh, China, in August of 2018, you kind of see where, how the virus has spread throughout the continent. It spread very quickly. So it's basically all throughout Asia. And again, Keith's gonna talk about that. Now, I, ta I call this the Trojan horse, feed the Trojan horse for the risk of viral transport and transmission. And you know the story about the Trojan horse, the Greeks brought the hiding in the horse, they brought it into the Troy kingdom and they got out that night and killed all the Trojans. I think this is the same thing with feed and viruses, especially coming from countries that handle grain this way, as you see on the screen. This is actually how grain is dried in Asia. It's a cultural event. It's been, they've been doing it for centuries. You can see animal contact, uh, person contact, fomite contact, vehicle contact, I think a really good way to contaminate grain, which is then bagged up and sent to the United States. Now, we wanted to study that, and we've done several projects I'm gonna briefly review for you, looking at whether viruses could live and feed over extended periods of time under representative conditions. The first attempt we looked at was, could we set up models to simulate movement of contaminated feed from Asia to Des Moines, or from Eastern Europe to Des Moines. So specifically Beijing to Des Moines, and then Warsaw, Poland to Des Moines. And we set these models up to look at with using representative transport times. Uh, we spiked the feed with viruses. We put them in a, a container that would actually simulate the environmental situation over sea on land as regards to temperature and relative humidity. So we tried to do it as, as accurately as we could, realizing it was a laboratory study. And I have to say, uh, most of the work was done at Eric Nelson's lab at South Dakota, which is BSL-2. Megan Niederwerder with the BSL-3 facility at Kansas State is where the ASF work was done, as well as work with pseudorabies and classical swine fever. So if we didn't have the access, uh, the chance to work with Megan, who's fantastic to begin with, and then they have this wonderful facility there where we can actually work with these viruses, we'd still be playing with surrogates. This is what we learned from several studies at Megan's lab and, and my lab and Eric's lab. This is the, the, the simulation, moving viruses in the laboratory under control conditions from Beijing to Des Moines, from Warsaw, Poland to Des Moines. So there on the left, you see the ingredients we used. These are ingredients that we import from China. We wanted to use representative ingredients. So you can see lots of different kinds of soy products Conventional soybean meal is high protein, low fat. Organic soybean meal is high uh, fat, low protein. 
Soy oil cake, you know, is the leftovers after oil extraction. DDGs, various vitamins, amino acids, various types of pet foods, and pork sausage casings. So all of these things are being imported into the United States from China, for example. Positive control of complete feed and negative control. Stock virus control on the bottom meant we, in our little experimental containers that we use to harbor these uh, ingredients and virus during the simulation. That was, that was the virus alone in the container without any feed matrix. Okay, just seeing if the virus could survive. So we put, the, we put the, all these ingredients together in these little vials. They've got a vented cap on the top. We put them in an environmental chamber. We program that environmental chamber to change the temperature and humidity four times a day to simulate what would happen over land and over sea using actual weather data on land and sea. So we wanted to make it as real as we could. So what you see on the top are the various viruses that we used. Uh, SVA, that's Seneca virus. That's a great surrogate for foot and mouth disease virus. They're in the same uh, uh, virus family. Then you see the ASF. That's the work done in Megan's lab. Pseudorabies, PED, uh, porcine sapelovirus. That's a good surrogate for swine vesicular disease virus. Classical swine fever or hog cholera. There's PCV2, PERS-174, vesicular stomatitis virus, and influenza A virus of swine. So everywhere on this chart you see a red box with a plus sign. That means the virus was alive at the end of the simulation. Either the 37-day journey from Des Moines to, I'm sorry, from uh, Beijing to Des Moines, or the 30-day journey from Warsaw, Poland to Des Moines, okay? And we, obviously where you see green means it did not survive. So you see a couple things here. If you read down from the virus level, you see some of these viruses live really well in feed. I mean, look how well ASF lived in those ingredients. If you just go down the ASF column, lots of red there, okay? And then if you look at across, look at from the ingredient perspective, some of these ingredients are really protective. Look at the soy. Look how well these viruses are living in soy. This is a highly repeatable event that's been uh, reproduced over and over and over again at Plum Island, Kansas State, South Dakota State. Everybody is reporting the same thing, that for some reason, soy-based products are, are very protective to not just one virus, but multiple viruses, okay? So you can see some viruses don't live well at all in feed. If you look at influenza, vesicular stomatitis, PERS virus 174, look at that. There's two times, two ingredients where this virus lived during these journeys in soy products, okay? Soy products, I'm gonna keep harm hammering on soy. And we talk about PERS breaks this summer and how could that happen, but look at the protective effect of soy. And I'm gonna open the door for questioning whether PERS virus is being moved around in the feed this summer over very short periods of time. It's not a foreign animal disease, but a domestic disease. So this is, this is at home stuff, as well as uh, across the pond. Now, Megan Niederwerder took this a little farther. She said, well, that was cool work. That shows survival during transport. But what about transmission? Megan took the virus ASF in her laboratory, BSL-3. She put it in feed, she put it in water, and showed that both of those matrices could uh, transmit to the virus to pigs during natural feeding or drinking behavior. She calculated the oral dose of the virus in feed. So in, in feed and water, it was about 10 to the four in feed, if I remember, and 10 to the one in water. So very infective through water. Uh, she also showed through modeling that the more often the pig would consume feed, the lower that needed the necessary dose to get infection. So it's not so much a one-time take a bite and it's over with, as you know, pigs feed all the time. She showed that more often the pigs consumed contaminated feed the easier it was to infect them through even lower and lower and lower doses, which I thought was just great that she showed that. Megan also calculated the half-life. She took our transatlantic model showing uh, feed movement from uh, Warsaw, Poland to uh, Des Moines, and she reproduced that, but then she also calculated half-life beyond the 30-day survival, and she showed that about 12 days on average with a range of what, 9.6 9 to 14.2, this virus lives for a long time in feed, way beyond 30 days. So it's got a roughly a 12-day half-life, uh, which uh, you know how that works, <laughs> the time it takes for 50% of the uh, virus to decay. So that that's really shows you 
how stable this virus is in feed. Now, soy, 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 we're hammering on soy. We bring in soy. The United States imports soy from several places. This is a paper that we did with Gil Patterson, who's got the ability to analyze the US government harmonized tariff schedule data, which is, records all the imports coming into the United States from around the world. So he's able to actually show that in 2018 and 2019, we brought soy products in from several ASF positive countries listed there on the left. And you see the top three, Ukraine, China, and Russia. And you see in 2018 and 2019, we were bringing in a lot of soy, 100 and some metric tons, 70 some, met 70 some thousand metric tons in 2018 and 2019 respectively. So we can kind of understand that this is happening. Now, where does it, where does it come in? We also wanted to look at, you know, this is, this is, these are China imports. Uh, we're looking at different ports. So we got tons on the y-axis, we got time on the x-axis, and we got the various ports uh, outlined there where the products come in. So you can see the majority of the Chinese imports come into San Francisco, which makes sense, right? You can see that over time, though, the trend is going down. Look at that blue line on top there. That's into San Francisco. The, the, the import quantities are going down. Now, 2018 is when the announcement of China being ASF positive was. Look at the decrease that's happened and was, has continued through 2020. Now, I called the soy board about that and I said, how come we're seeing that sharp decrease? They said, that's because of the science and because of the awareness. And it's just that pressure that our industry, because of the concern over ASF importation through contaminated soy, has just put on the world, basically, put on, put on our nation. So we've done this without regulation. We've done this through voluntary good science and good education, so I'm happy about that. And again, 2020 data were even lower than 2019. So it's a good trend. Now, that work was all done experimentally, you know, as I told you, a little laboratory with some incubators and things, and it was criticized for that. And I, I think that's a fair criticism. You know, it's small amounts of virus, small amounts of feed. You know, does this really happen in the real world? Can virus live in an actual journey, in a shipment, under real world conditions? And so we set up a demonstration project. Demonstration projects, the goal, is to show whether the laboratory data are, re, are valid under real world conditions. So this is a new paper we just published a bit ago. I'm gonna show you, to, I'm gonna see whether viruses can survive during a continental journey around the United States. So we're gonna take uh, one ton totes. Instead of five grams of feed in the lab, we're gonna expand to one ton totes. We're gonna take conventional soybean meal, organic soybean meal, and complete feed. We're gonna spike those totes with a hot spot, basically taking PERS, PED, and Seneca in that little ice cube there you see on the right, at five logs each, about a 10 milliliter ice cube, we're gonna spike those totes and, and kind of create a hot spot like aflatoxin, for example, or salmonella, and it contaminates feed. Not a wide dispersal of contamination, but a focused area. So what we did was we took a full tote, and we, we held it above an empty tote, and we opened the spout below and let the feed run from top to bottom. And when the, when the bottom tote was about uh, half full, I took that ice cube, and you can see in the middle there, that's my arm, I'm kind of going like this and I'm flipping it into the tote, and then we're filling the rest of the tote up. So I don't want to know where that hot spot is. You can see on the right what it looked like. I did stop to take a picture. You can see the little bit of ice or so right in that red circle. So I think we created a nice little model. Now, we sampled with a grain probe using a standard means of sampling from totes from the American Association of Feed Control Officials, validated by Dr. Jones from Kansas State. And you can see we're going to take 10 grain probes from this, using this schematic from each tote, and we're going to mix it together in a composite. So there's our grain probe, there's our tote. You can see the, the relationship of depth. And that picture on the right shows you those 10 little flags, just to kind of that double X pattern. That's where I took those 10 samples, again, pooled it all together, and then we started to test it. We took that feed, it's about a kilogram each time we pooled into that composite, we washed it, we put it on a paint shaker, and let, it gave us the ability to wash the entire amount of feed, and we centrifuged that liquid down and took the supernatant off. I didn't want to take a subset of this sample, I wanted to, I wanted to test the whole kilogram. 
And we wanted to bulletproof this project because now what we're going to do is we're going to uh, <laughs> we're going to take these totes and we're going to put them on a truck and we're going to drive them around the United States. And now they have PERS, PED, and Seneca inside. And I want to be very careful that this is not a public relations disaster. So we had no other products on board. The driver took no, there were no other stops. This was, we modeled a commercial trip, but it wasn't a, a true commercial trip because it was the only, we had, this was the only cargo on board. We didn't stop anywhere except for gas and hotels. We put a GPS tracker on the truck. We ran this study by the FDA, Center for Veterinary Medicine, as well as the USDA, letting them know what we're doing ahead of time so they could critique it. We talked to the state animal health officials in all the states where the truck was going to have an overnight. We gave them a letter and talked about the project ahead of time. We asked for feedback. And then we labeled the totes with some specific language from the uh, FDA, I'll show you. Here's the letter that the driver carried with him basically from the U uh, FDA Center for Veterinary Medicine, basically saying this is a research project. None of this feed is going to be used in commercial pig production. And we know what's going on. And then there's the label on the tote, not for human or animal consumption, uh, research use only. So there's our totes. We're going to have seven of them. We're going to have two conventional soy totes. We're going to have two uh, organic soy totes. We're going to have two complete feed totes. All six of those spiked with the ice cube. And we're going to have one negative control tote at the end. So we're going to have seven totes on the truck. We're going to push them all to the front. And we're going to put this door there to barricade them. So just in case, that, heaven forbid, there'd be an accident, they weren't going to be rolling around. We had some controls along too. We, those little orange caps you see there, that's 30 grams of feed. Each of these feed ingredients spiked with virus. The vented cap allows the virus and the feed to feel the ambient environment. We're going to take those along as controls. And then we're going to put uh, temperature and relative humidity gauges in the totes as well to measure what's happening at the tote level. So there's our 18 wheeler. It's loaded up with totes. Now we're going to drive it around the United States. We're going to start up in uh, Minnesota. We're going to go down to Kansas City. We're going to head over to the mountains, into Denver, down to Albuquerque, through Texas, across the, along the Gulf Coast. We're going to go up the eastern seaboard into New England, and then we're going to come back to Minnesota, paralleling the Great Lakes. We did it this way for two reasons. We wanted to make a, a real run. We wanted to use a real journey, even though it wasn't a true shipment, but it was a true journey. And we wanted to expose the viruses and the feed ingredients to as many different climates as we could. So hot, cold, wet, dry, you kind of get the drift there. 23 days this truck was on the road in December of last year. You can see the, we covered uh, almost 10,800 kilometers, so uh, close to 6,000 miles. And then we covered 29 states. Let's see what we learned. Let's look at the environmental conditions in the, in the tote. Let's look for the presence of the viral genome by PCR on the day of departure and by the time the study was done. And then let's see if the viruses were alive. That's what we were really trying to see. Can the viruses survive under these real world conditions? These are temperature and re relative humidity data. You see location of probe on the left. SBMC is conventional soybean meal. SBMO is organic. You can see across the top the number of data points we collected and then the mean, max, and min temperature and relative humidity. It was interesting, although these are only two totes shown here on the slide, there were significant differences in temperature and relative humidity between those two types of products. Why, I don't know. It's, it's not a very big sample size, but it's an interesting observation. Now, we use that grain probe approach to see if we could find viral RNA. To see if by PCR, could we find the virus in the totes by sampling and using that double X schematic? So we got tote and the various ingredients listed there, SBMC 1 and 2. There were two conventional totes, you remember. SBMO 1 and 2, two totes. Complete feed 1 and 2, and then our negative control. Day P, days post-inoculation, day 0, and there's day post-inoculation, day 23. So we're doing it when we leave and when we come home. Viruses across based on PCR, and you can see that we could find RNA. We found presence of the viral genome in these totes using this grain probe method. Again, we put those cubes in blind. We didn't know exactly where to put the, where to put the probe. We just followed the double X pattern. Sometimes we fanned, though. Sometimes you can see we got negative on all our readings. Interesting here that soy totes, there were more positives out of the soy totes 
than there were out of the complete feed totes. And again, I'm wondering if that's somewhat the protective effect of soy. So it just showed, yeah, we could use that grain probe method and we could find virus in the case. Here's the viability, though. This is what really counts. Um, the totes on the left, as described, 23 days post inoculation. How, were the, how was viability measured? For the soy products, the soy totes, we created a bioassay. We, we, as I told you, we, shoot, we processed those samples in the laboratory. We shook them up with a paint shaker. We centrifuged that material down. We took the supernatant off those samples and we injected it into pigs orally for PED, intramuscularly for PERS, and then for uh, Seneca, we went intranasally. So that was the bioassay model. We did that for the soy products, as you can see. All the SBM work there, bioassay. The complete feed was included because we wanted to feed that to pigs in their natural conditions and see whether they would get infected. So it was almost like a transmission experiment too. So that's why we had the complete feed. And you can see PED, Seneca, PERS, lots of positives. All three of these viruses lived in the soy totes throughout this 23-day journey. No problem. We could, we could reproduce it by bioassay in the soy. No problem. In the complete feed, only the Seneca and the PED lived. The PERS did not survive for 23 days in the, in the complete feed, which I think makes sense. That's a long time for PERS to remain viable. So we showed that this virus, these three viruses, can survive in different feed ingredients under representative conditions. And that's why we call this evidence now. This isn't just an experiment. This isn't just a few data points. Collectively speaking, this is now evidence that I think shows for the first time that three significant pathogens of pigs can survive in feed ingredients under real world representative conditions. We had a representative volumes, feed ingredients, journey, truck, you got it. We tried to set this up as real as you can make it. And the viruses lived. So to me, there's no discussion anymore whether viruses can live in soy or sometimes even in complete feed. Now, we can't predict frequency of this because this is actually, a, it's a huge experiment, but it's actually really small. It's only got one truck. It's only got seven totes, you know, so the sample size isn't very big. So we can't use this to predict how often this will happen, but we can, I think, very confidently say, in conjunction with the laboratory data, viruses live in feed. Certain viruses live in certain feed ingredients, what I call high-risk combinations, and I think soy is our leader there. All right, and so now we've shown survival. What do we do about it? What's the industry doing with this information? How are they reacting? I've been doing quite a bit of work with feed additives to show whether the viruses could be neutralized in feed, in feed by certain ingredients that we add to the feed. So for this study, we did this in our BSL-2 facility. Our BSL-2 facility is set up with six individual rooms, filtered in and out, separate air spaces, so we can have treatments and controls in the same facility. Each room has its own feed bin. So I went out and I called my friends in the industry that work in the, uh, in the feed business, or the additive business, and I asked them, would you be interested in this study? I'm gonna take a block of ice with Seneca, PERS, and PED. I wanna treat feed or not, and I'm gonna throw this ice block in the bin. So each room has its own bin. We're gonna fill it up with treated or non-treated feed. We're gonna challenge it with the ice block with those three viruses, and we're gonna let pigs consume the feed under natural conditions. So you can see the companies there listed. Um, I wanted a lot of different products. I wanted a lot of different chemistry. I didn't want just all one type of chemistry. And I'm really happy to see, if you know anything about those products, we've got organic acids, uh, either multivalent or, or monovalent. We've got formaldehyde-based products. We've got medium-chain fatty acid products, short-chain, long-chain mixes. We've got uh, uh, essential oils in here. So a lot of different chemistries. So I was really happy about that. A couple things to disclose. You can see I've got some red asterisks there. Uh, Alltech Guardian, that's a product we developed and we sold it to Alltech, so I have a conflict of interest to disclose just for transparency purposes. And then I asked all the companies to bring $30,000 in product to participate in this study. And so that was a requirement. You have to pay 30 grand and you have to bring enough product to handle the, the feed that we're gonna, we're, we're gonna manufacture. I put the Provimi group there because at the last minute they changed their mind and pulled out. Didn't want to participate. I don't know really why. 
But anyway, we had some producers that wanted to test it because they were using it, and so they paid the money. That's where the money came for for that. So here's our challenge. We're going to take an ice block, one pound ice block with the three viruses at equal concentrations. We're going to throw her in the bin, climb up the ladder, drop her in the hole, and let Mother Nature take over after that. Then we're going to measure. We're going to take feeder samples with Swiffers, as you can see, looking to see whether the viruses got into the room. Were the viruses present in the feed? We're going to take oral fluids to determine whether the viruses are in the oral cavity of the pigs. We're going to measure clinically, do the pigs get sick? Remember again, they're either on mitigated diets or non-mitigated diets. So treated or non-treated. Then at the end of the 15-day period of study, we're going to necropsy 30 of the pigs in each room. We had 96 pigs in each room. We're going to ne necropsy 30 and look for the presence of infection to see whether pigs got PERS, whether they got uh, Seneca, whether they got PED. And what I'm going to show you mostly is some performance data, because I think that's the most interesting, average daily gain and percent mortality. We had five different experiments. I'm going to show you one of the five experiments. Basically, each experiment showed the same thing. Each experiment showed that if pigs are on a mitigated diet, they perform significantly better than pigs on the non-mitigated diet. So each, each uh, experiment had its own control group. So just to show you, this was experiment five. You see the products that were listed there participating in that particular aspect of the study. You see the positive control on the bottom, and you see the average daily gain data and the percent mortality data. So this is how we measured this along each of the five experiments. If we did a meta-analysis, we looked at all five experiments, looking at average daily gain for treatments versus controls, taking all those experiments together, there's a forest plot there on the right. You can see that there's a positive response in each experiment, showing that the use of a mitigant is a positive thing to do versus a control group. So the mitigant treated pigs in 14 of the 15 products we tested had significantly better performance than the control group. Even in the presence of the virus, we could still find evidence of the viruses in the, in the feed of the mitigated diets, sometimes even in the bodies of the pigs on mitigated diets. But clinically, they just smoked, and we didn't hardly lose a single pig on a mitigated diet, with the exception of one product. But 14 of the 15 products, pigs performed significantly better than on a control group. So feed additives for virus control is, I think, a very good thing to do. Another thing we've been doing is uh, in regards to storage time. We developed a process in Pipestone called Responsible Imports. We were thinking, can we take feed and hold it for a period of time? Because we know these viruses aren't going to live forever in this feed. They're going to slowly decay over time. Unless you freeze that feed, those viruses are going to slowly decay over time. So we said, well, let's, let's take feed, let's hold it for a period of time, say 30 days under controlled conditions, and kind of set up a process called responsible imports that we would hope other companies would like to use, other producers would like to use. And you see some of the principles of responsible imports, which is kind of an interesting set of questions there. The questions we never really have asked feed about feed in the past. It's kind of like how we talk about breeding stock. You know, where is it coming from? What's the status? Et cetera, et cetera. You see, you see the, uh, the questions there. We are changing human behavior in regards to how feed is considered as a risk as well as how feed is handled. It's like health papers for feed. So I'm going to show you how we do it in Pipestone. We've got a Chinese group uh, and a, a work with several Chinese organizations in uh, uh, for vitamins and, and amino acids, we're importing them into the United States into our uh, Pipestone site using this approach. And this is where I'd like to highlight Sam Nutrition. That's a company in Minneapolis. You'll see the, the role that Sam Nutrition is playing. They're the, actually the, the site where the ingredients come when they come in from China. So we've got a U.S. and China working together on this, focusing on fine ingredients. We've got a PhD nutritionist named Dr. Arkin Wu, who's Chinese. He went to these Chinese manufacturing plants, and he set up biosecurity plans for those plants. Clean, dirty lines, use of PPE, audit certification, real common sense stuff that we use on pig farms. So for example, here's a, a vitamin manufacturing plant in China. 
upper left hand corner is where you enter you see a bench there just like you do at a cell farm you sit on that bench you spin around you take off your shoes and you walk to the door put on PPE in the gray cabinet before you enter the facility there's the bagging room on top there you see how nice and clean that is and there's the warehouse all the bags of product now are covered in plastic sheets again trying to prevent cross-contamination that's how they used to be moved to the port down there in the, in the bottom left a lot of risk for cross-contamination there now this is how they get moved in one-time use totes into a sealed container that doesn't open until it gets to Minneapolis this is the SAM nutrition warehouse up in the left hand corner there where the products come directly from the uh, where the containers are, are directly unloaded so the red arrow shows you the doors where the incoming product enters a quarantine room so that container is finally opened at that point and goes into a quarantine room the yellow arrow shows you the stairways into the doorways one doorway and stairway for workers and another for drivers so we separate drivers from in, internal workers and the green arrow shows you the outgoing that's when the products ready to go to our mills that we work with that's where it leaves so separate entry and exit points down below that is a door you see the foot bath there that's where the driver would walk in he's got a sign in a ledger just like at a cell farm and then up top there is the area where this is all happening you see that's, that's as far as the driver goes he doesn't go beyond that panel here's the warehouse bags are all nicely plastic at uh, again at Sam Nutrition up there is a quarantine room this is interesting this is an idea that Dr. Roger Cochran our director of feed mills had and worked with Mr. Aporva Shaw who's the CEO of this company can we bring the feed right out of the container put it in an all-in-all -all quarantine room just like you would work with animals and you can see what it looks like right there and they have a door that closes once the feed is full or the room is full and the, and the quarantine starts again 30 days at room temperature 70 degrees Fahrenheit it's got its own separate forklift in that quarantine room and if you ever have to enter you've got foot baths and PPE to put on before you go in so again it's just a lot of common sense things we use on farms that we're now applying to feed we're gonna do a project that uh, will start this summer we don't know at what temperature we should hold this feed there's a lot of variation in the industry everyone's kind of using a 30-day storage time because that's logistically feasible but no one really knows what temperature that should be at so we're going to take totes of soy we're going to use ice cubes with Seneca we're going to spike those totes we're going to put them either at 70 degrees 60 degrees or 50 degrees Fahrenheit then we're going to feed that soy to pigs to see whether there's infectious virus so a very very stable virus in soy and soy obviously the most protective ingredient that's going to happen this quarter four last thing is the impact has any of this done any good at all are people paying attention to this or am I just beating my head against the wall I'm happy to say that responsible imports has caught on a lot in the US industry there are many companies that are following a similar type of a program we have to standardize it and that's why we need the, the temperature data but also around the world Canada based on this work you've seen has set up a national program where feed ingredients from high-risk countries with certification go into a holding area for a period of time at the area of the port before they go into the mill Australia just also set the same thing up and as I mentioned in Europe the European Food Safety Authority just published the opinion looking at how viruses could move throughout the European Union particularly ASF and they said well feed it's low risk it's not nearly as high risk as wild boar or the movement of contaminated meat but it is low risk but it cannot be ignored due to the high consequence as well as the data that supports it so feed kind of made the cut now it's part of the decision tree in regards to risks there will be a special issue on, from transbounding emerging diseases a very very nice journal that I'm guest editing with Dr. Gordon Spronk that will focus on this topic of feed as a disease risk for transmission uh, feed as a risk for disease transmission looking at reviews cases original research and industry actions coming out at the end of the year so I'm happy to say within about a seven year period of time this very young area of science has already been placed into this position with a special issue in this very prestigious journal I'm happy about that the ASV American Association of Swine Veterinarians just wrote a position statement 
saying that we got to work together at, at, at the North American level. Canada can't do it by themselves. Mexico needs to be involved. U.S. needs to be involved. We got to work as a continent. And I think that was a great line in the sand that the ASV came up with. Great position. And finally, I hope I've convinced you, and I think I'm just about out of time, that there's a growing body of evidence of scientific data supporting the fact that certain viruses and certain feed ingredients are very compatible and, can, and can be, viruses can be transported, they can survive, and they can be spread to pigs through feed. We've got scientific data to look at how to mitigate that risk, be it with additives, holding time, we're improving that information with new projects this fall. It's really changed how we operate. It's changed how we think about feed. It's changed how we handle feed. It's again, it's, I think it's impacted human behavior in a positive way. I think that's the best thing about this is we're getting better because of this information. And again, we got to work together as a continent. This is simply not just a country issue. This is a continental issue. So uh, that's it for me. I think uh, we got a few minutes maybe for some questions. But anyway, I do appreciate the invitation, and I hope you found it interesting and learned one new thing at least today. <laughs> we'll go ahead and open the floor for questions for Dr. D. Yes, Sarah. Yeah, good question. So Sarah's asking about testing of this of feed. Right now, testing for foreign animal diseases in feed is not allowed. The USDA won't allow that with good reason. We don't have really good sampling methods to sample big volumes. We don't have real functional PCRs yet. Feed's a very difficult matrix to, to work with. So we probably would get a great deal of risk from having a false positive. We'd also probably have a whole bunch of false negatives because how are you gonna sample a bolster an ocean liner, a freighter, for example, full of feed. So the USDA will not allow that, and, uh, and I, I understand. There's work being done, though, at uh, there's a National Feed Risk Task Force I'm part of, along with several other organizations, and we're talking about it. We're trying to improve the PCR, first of all, so PCR could be more accurate by t through the, uh, on the feed sample, and Dr. Diego Dial and Cornell is doing that. So there is work being done, Sarah, but right now we can't do that. Uh, and the D-Labs won't even allow us to test for the foreign animal disease. You can test for PERS. You, know, you can test for all the domestic diseases, but you can't test for any foreign animal diseases. It seems strange that there's not good diagnostics for this. We've been dealing with this for a long time now. But not in feed. Feed is a very different sample than blood or spleen or tonsil. No, for a long time. Yeah. Right, I mean, but, we proved this a long time ago, right? The, oh, the PCD. Seven years. Yeah. yeah. Like well, we can we can test for PED, but when ASF came, that's what changed the game because we showed ASF lives in feed. That's when everyone started asking the questions about testing, prior to, you know, taking the material off the ship. We don't have we're not ready yet on testing for ASF. Not for it. Not for ASF. Yes, sir. Yeah, so, yeah, good question. What, what's my opinion on the, the risk of feed for domestic diseases? So PERS, PED, as you mentioned. PED is, I think, commonly found in feed. I think PED, feed is probably, other than infected pigs moving around, pe feed's probably the primary vehicle for moving PED from site to site, no question. It survived extremely well, as you saw. It lived for the 23-day journey in feed. It was infectious, we fed it to pigs and they got sick. 
PERS is a little bit of a wild card because it's not nearly as stable in feed. But you saw that it's lived in soy for 37 days from the red-green chart. And you saw it lived in soy for 23 days from the transcontinental chart. So I'm wondering if soybean meal gets contaminated and you take that soybean meal to your mill and you backhaul complete feed back to your farm and you do it within a one day period of time and dump it right in a bin and pigs start eating it right away, is that a possible route that PERS is entering? I think for PERS to be a risk, you gotta have kind of all the stars aligned. Uh, it's obviously much more of a risk in cold weather too. I'm, the more cases I hear about this 144 moving around US to far reaching places and spreading very rapidly like PED did, I'm wondering about feed, if it could be playing a role in that. But I, to your question, I wouldn't put, I'd put feed, PERS, I'd put uh, obviously pigs, we've got trucks, we've got air, then I'd probably start putting feed down there for, for PERS. That's not as high as PED. Good question. That kind of puts it in the real world. So you talk about backhauling, you know, hauling soy and then turning around and hauling feed. From a practical standpoint, if you go to these soy truck plants, and that's where the soybean comes from, have you identified possibilities where PED can get into the bean meal? Now, I can understand if it's in the bean meal, it might be instead of yeah. the residue of the truck, but is that really a, a, a reasonable option? That Good question, if you're, Tim. If you're yeah. Organic soybean meal from China seems much more likely yeah. to me than just. Yeah. You know, Good question. So what's the, what's the, what's the potential for this model to be? We don't, I don't know. You'd have to go to the crush plants and look. It'd be easy to do if you get a chance to sample around the environment. You could, you could look for viruses there. We did that in mills with PED on the PED days and found the PED everywhere in the mill. Obviously very political and a sensitive topic. It's just a hypothesis at this time. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I think one thing people could do right away is if they are back hauling from dropping off soy at the mill with complete feed, stop doing that. I mean, that's one thing I think you could do right away just in case that could be true. Because that's, that's kind of how it would have to happen, I think. You'd have to, within a very short period of time, you'd have to, have, you'd have to contaminate your truck and then bring it back. I mean, there's other ways to contaminate trucks, too, as we know. Yes, sir. Across all of these mitigants, the one product that performed the highest was Selkirk. But there were many other products for PERS that were quite effective as well. Basically all 14 that I, te I tested 15, one didn't work. The other products performed extremely well too. So any of those listed there, I believe if I recall, had a really good efficacy against PERS. But taken in context across the entire experiment, the Chemin product was uh, the most efficacious.